Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest in Oriel's line of online talks. I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, but first I wanted to introduce myself. I'm the Director of Development, Marco Zhang, and uh, I'm really pleased to say that college is now open and we're very much looking forward to welcoming alumni back whenever you can make it, perhaps later this year to the garden party or at one of the Gordies. But meanwhile, um, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Catherine Murphy, who will be speaking today uh, about melancholy, a new anatomy. For those who haven't been back to Oxford for a little while, the Western Library has a rotation of uh, exhibitions, which are absolutely terrific. The Western is the new wing of the Bodleian, which uh, has on display uh, rotating exhibitions as well as a collection of the Bodleian's treasures. And for the past couple of months and running until the 20th of March is uh, anatomy, uh, a melancholy rather, a new anatomy uh, for which Katie Murphy has been the curator. She's a fellow of uh, English literature at Oriel College and associate professor at the Faculty of English. Katie's academic work focuses on uh, Renaissance poetry, prose, philosophy, and the literature essay, though she also writes about modern poetry, Czech literature, and still life painting. A co edited volume on essays from Montaigne to the present was published in September last year, and she's currently finishing two books, Robert Burton, A Vital Melancholy, and A Tottering Universal, Metaphysical Prose in the 17th Century. As we're moving towards the end of Hillary term, I think we all think that uh, melancholy is a topic that we want to discuss and hear more about at this time. So Katie, if I could hand over to you. At the end of the talk, we'll offer an opportunity to ask questions. Please do put these into chat. Uh, or put your hand, uh, raise your hand um, in the function in Zoom, and we'll call upon you to speak. But thank you, Katie, very much for joining us. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Marco, and uh, thank you, uh, Catherine, as well, for organising this evening's event. Um, as uh, those of you who have been my student uh, know, and I saw a couple of names that I recognised entering the room at the beginning, uh, talking about the anatomy of melancholy is one of my favourite things. So thank you all for um, being so gracious as to come to listen to me do so. Um, melancholy, a new anatomy, as uh, Marco just said, was uh, was and is an exhibition that's still running at the Bodleian in the Western Library, and it celebrates the 400th anniversary of Robert Burton's fabulous book, The Anatomy of Melancholy. Um, so it has some local Oxford interest because uh, Burton was a student, that's to say a fellow at Christchurch College. Um, he entered Christchurch in 1599 and then never left um, until he died in his chambers in 1640. Um, he was an incredibly bookish scholar who spent his entire life writing the anatomy of melancholy, as I'll go on to discuss. Um, and his bookishness is also manifest in the fact that he was the fellow librarian, uh, something that I am currently um, doing for Oriel, so I have a particular sympathy for that, uh, for that particular role. Um, the fellow librarian at Christchurch, um, he amassed his own substantial library of, of books and on his death donated um, all of his books to Christchurch and to the Bodleian. Um, I mention this partly to give you a sense of his bookishness, but also because there's one particular Oriel connection in that relation, um, which is that the, the librarian at the Bodleian at that point was a man called John Rouse, who was a fellow of Oriel and a good friend of Burton's. So there are some very local connections. Um, but the exhibition also, we hope, we curators hope, has a more general appeal. Um, I am one of the curators, um, but all of the rest of the curators, and there were another six curators on the team, um, are uh, in the Department of Psychiatry or the Department of Clinical Psychology, um, or they are practicing doctors and neuroscientists themselves. Um, and one of the important things about the exhibition or one of the things that we wanted it to do was to link um, this 400 year old book, The Anatomy of Melancholy, um, to the contemporary research that my colleagues in neuroscience and psychiatry were doing. Um, so what I want to do today is both explain something about the anatomy of melancholy, about early modern melancholy, um, and about Burton and his great book. 
but also um, some of what I learned in the process of the interdisciplinary work that was necessary to put together this exhibition between um, the, uh, a group of psychiatrists and me who spends my time reading the literature of the 17th century um, about how research into early modern and Renaissance literature um, and history can have um, lively contemporary use and interest and about the value of the kind of public engagement work that we've been doing. Um, in the past, my work has usually been um, directed to explaining the differences of then, you know, the differences of history. Um, but this was a challenge to me because it made me um, think about the similarities and the ways in which the kind of things that I read, work on and think about can be revivified in the contemporary world. Um, why read The Anatomy of Melancholy now was one of the questions. So first of all, um, what was melancholy then, I say, reverting to type? Um, so melancholy was one of the four humours in the ancient humoral theory of medicine, which originated with the ancient uh, Greek uh, uh, theoreticians and writers of medicine, Hippocrates and Galen. There were four humours, the blood, the phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. And these are... Uh, uh, liquids, these are, these are liquids which pass around the body, um, taking um, different spirits and nutrients to different places in the body. I say are, um, but this is within the theory of the, of the time. And they stipulate both the, the health of the body and the temperament of the person who, um, who has the, the balance of the humours. So each of those four humours is associated with a kind of character. So blood is associated with the sanguine person, so the cheerful person who is well disposed. Phlegm is a, associated predictably with the phlegmatic person, so somebody who is, um, who is relatively slothful, who is slow to uh, uh, kind of rouse. Yellow bile or choler is related to the choleric, um, which is anger, um, speedy response times, recklessness. And then black bile, melancholy, um, is associated with fear and sorrow and sadness. And this system of the four humours is related to a kind of macrocosmic, microcosmic way of thinking about the world and about the stuff of the world, so that the humour itself maps on to all kinds of different things and a fourfold division of things that works all the way from uh, the, the elements all the way up to the stars. On the screen you can see a couple of um, illustrations of this from the 17th century. So one of them is Thomas Walkington's book, The Optic Glass of Humours. And on the left hand side, you can see a series of concentric circles which associate each of the humours with different stages in life. So adolescence or age or youth, um, with different seasons of the year, with the summer and the autumn, the winter, with the different winds, with the different elements, and then with different planets and star signs. So this is a system which reads the human body in relation to the entirety of the cosmos. Um, and melancholy, you can see, is on the bottom left-hand side of that quadrant. Um, and it is related to old age, to winter, um, to the Earth, and to the god Saturn. Um, and its relation to winter and old age is related to the fact that it is dry, um, and cold, um, so it is, it's, it, it's lacking the warmth that carries the blood. Um, and you can see that it's opposite the blood diagonally on the, on the screen, which means that it has the, the opposite qualities to the, to the warm blood. Um, if your four humours are all in balance, then everything is well. That's why it's called temperament. You are well tempered, you are well balanced. But naturally, either through your disposition or through um, circumstances, you can reach imbalances of the humours, excesses or deficiencies, and then reach disorder or disease. And melancholy among the four humours has a special status. First of all, because it's the only one of the four humours which in fact doesn't exist. Um, not that they knew that at the time, but you know, blood, phlegm and bile are in fact substances of the body. But melancholy is a construct of the way that they think about um, the natural body. But it's also the only one where the matter, um, the black bile, is also the name of the disease that comes from it, and that disease is melancholy. Um, so 
And the definition of melancholy, um, as opposed to other kinds of mental distor disorder and distress in the 17th century, is that it's a kind of dotage without a fever, having for its ordinary companions fear and sadness without any apparent occasion. And that's really important to melancholy, that it's without any apparent occasion. So things like grief um, or shock or fright are all natural responses to stimuli. But the thing that is pathological about melancholy is that it um, uh, is aroused um, without any um, without any cause. It's a disposition, it's a tendency that doesn't seem to have a noticeable prompt that has brought it about. Um, that relatively simple definition, however, um, belies a real complexity and a characteristic of variety, which is, um, which is uh, typical of melancholy. And here, um, I'm just going to read the quotation um, on the screen uh, to give you a sense, a beginning sense of Burton's prose in the anatomy. The four and 20 letters, he says, that's to say the letters of the alphabet um, in the early modern period, U and V and I and J are the same letter. So there are only 24 letters in the alphabet. Uh, the four and 20 letters make no more variety of words in diverse languages than melancholy conceits produce diversity of symptoms in several persons. They are irregular, obscure, various, so infinite. Proteus himself is not so diverse. You may as well make the moon a new coat as a true character of a melancholy man. As soon find the motion of a bird in the air as the heart of man, a melancholy man. As this might suggest, um, there is a tension in Burton's title, The Anatomy of Melancholy, between the infinite variety um, and illegibility of melancholy and the idea that it can be anatomized. Um, Burton lives in the great age of the emergence of anatomy um, in the university. So Andreas Vesalius's uh, um, book on the fabric of the human body, the frontispiece to which is on the right hand side of your screen, um, uh, introduced images of the interior of the body um, to, the, to the reading public and to the learned public in a way that hadn't previously been the case. Universities um, across Europe, um, like Padua and Montpellier and Paris, um, uh, opened anatomy theatres, also Leiden University had an anatomy theatre, which previously had not been the case because medicine was a, was a learned discipline that rested on the interpretation of books and not the interpretation of bodies. Um, and Burton takes this up in the title of his book, The Anatomy of Melancholy, what it is, with all the kinds, causes, symptoms, prognostics, and several cures of it, in three partitions, with their several sections, members, and subsections, philosophically, medicinally, historically, opened and cut up. So there's a real emphasis on the cutting action and dissecting action of anatomizing their sections, members, subsections, and cutting up. Um, and the book itself anatomizes its topic through synoptic tables that divide up the stuff of the book into um, the, the separate sections. So it, it aims to look like a, a kind of orderly um, and well dissected topic that will cover its entire range. Um, and this is a kind of fashion for bringing out what is interior, for demonstrating the interior of the body, and both in the frontispiece to Vesalius, which you see on the right hand side, and in the Rembrandt painting, um, the anatomy lesson, which is at the bottom of your screens, you can see the beginnings of opening up the interior of the body as a way of gaining knowledge about it. But melancholy, as I've said, resists that kind of opening. Famously, um, Hamlet, when he first treads the, the, the boards in, in Shakespeare's play, um, tells his mother that it is not alone his inky cloak nor the customary suits of solemn black, nor the windy suspiration of forced breath, nor the way that his face is composed, nor his tears. None of these things is truly donating, denoting what he is. These seem, he says, for they are actions that a man might play, but I have that within that passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Hamlet is 
the archetypal melancholic of the early modern stage um, and a, a study in melancholy, a study in the posture of melancholy. Um, and what he has to say there paradoxically suggests that it's both a matter of costume, wearing black, crying, sighing, demonstrable signs on the surface, but also what can't be shown, what is inexpressible, the sorrow without cause that is interior and incommunicable. Um, and which is bound up with the interiority and the idiosyncrasy of uh, the person. Um, and this kind of fashionable melancholy, this, this sense of melancholy as the badge of your depth, of your, of your, your um, kind of sophistication and your sensitivity, is something that can be seen across the culture in the Renaissance. Um, and in this sense, melancholy can be glamorous and even enjoyable, a kind of voluptuous pleasure. Um, on the screen at the moment, you can see um, on the one hand, a melancholy knight, um, a kind of posturing stage melancholic. Um, on the right hand side, um, Albrecht Dürer's amazing engraving Melancholia, um, which shows this inspired um, angel figure who is neglecting the stuff of the world in order to um, resort to contemplation. And in the middle, an image of fashionable melancholy in the person of Edward Herbert, Lord Herbert of Cherbury. Um, and the poem in the middle is, is Burton's own composition, which talks about the doubleness of melancholy, the positive aspects, as well as the negative. When to myself, he says, I act and smile with pleasing thoughts the time beguile, by a brookside or wood so green, unheard, unsought for, or unseen, a thousand pleasures do me bless and crown my soul with happiness. All my joys besides are folly, none so sweet as melancholy. So in addition to the sense of melancholy as an almost universal disorder, um, which affects everybody who has melancholy in their body and in their person, there's also the idea of a joyous melancholy, a melancholy that brings happiness and that brings pleasure and laughter. Um, so when the anatomy of melancholy appeared in 1621, um, there was a double appeal of the subject to readership it was a medical problem of almost universal scope. And it was also an attractive and very prominent cultural phenomenon. And Burton's book was immediately popular. The first edition was published, as I said, in 1621. And then there were five further editions over the course of Burton's life before the, or, well, the, the fifth of those, the sixth edition is a posthumous edition, 1651. And over that course of the time, Burton revises and revises the book so that the final, um, the final 1651 edition is over half a million words long. That is a long book, and it is a book that has always attracted superlatives. Um, Nicholas Lezard, writing in The Guardian, called it the best book ever written. Um, another Guardian writer, Stephen Ross, called it the maddest book ever written. Um, and Sir William Osler, who was Regis Professor of Medicine at the beginning of the 20th century, said that it was the best medical treatise ever written by a layman. And it's a book of kind of inexhaustible interest and distraction and entertainment. Samuel Johnson said of it that it was the only book that had got him out of bed two hours earlier than he had hoped to rise. John Keats um, wrote um, his poem Lamia based on section, uh, a section of the Anatomy of Melancholy. And Philip Pullman, um, contemporary author, has called it his favourite book. And he appeared, um, we, we did an opening um, panel session for the exhibition, and he was one of the other panellists on that occasion. So what's the anatomy like? Um, one of the reasons that readers since 1621 have found it so intensely absorbing is the impossibility of limiting its scope. So Burton claims early in the book that all the world is mad, is melancholy, dotes. And if melancholy is the whole world's malady, then nothing is irrelevant. And the anatomy um, is an exhibition of the world swallowing encyclopedic ambition of the Renaissance. It includes a satirical preface and the persona of Democritus Jr, named in honour of the laughing philosopher of the ancients, and has anecdotes on everything from Burton's childhood memories to melancholics who believe themselves made of butter, to a man who excreted an eel, to how trees fall in love. 
there are digressions on cosmology and geography, on sex, on kissing, on tobacco and utopian government, and extraordinary amounts of quotation from authorities and from literature ancient and modern. And it also has a prose that is full of personality. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, you can see a passage from very early in the book, from the third page of the preface, um, Democritus Jr. to the reader, where he's describing how distracted he is by polymathy, by the urge to know everything. He says that he has a running wit, an unconstant, unsettled mind, and had a great desire to have some smattering in all. Um, to taste of every dish and sip of every cup. Um, and then he calls it his roving humour, which he has ever had. And like a ranging spaniel that barks at every bird he sees, leaving his game, I have followed all, saving that which I should and may justly complain and truly, qui ubique est nusquam est, he who is everywhere is nowhere. Um, so Burton has a distractible style. He has distracted himself by the multiplicity of subjects that he's interested in and wants to be interested in. And he is also incapable of keeping his style um, associated with um, one authority, one language. Um, a third of the book is in Latin, which he um, almost always translates into, into English. Um, and he can't keep his raving, his raving and roving spaniel mind still as he is thinking. To be about everything, to be encyclopedic in this sense, is an ambivalent gift. A melancholy is a disease, as we've seen, and it's characterized by infinite variety. And since we're all susceptible, it's as various as human beings and as readers of Burton's book. And I've taken to calling this the anxiety of variety, which is a kind of fear that the world is too various and multifarious to be understood. People talk about the early modern period as suffering an information overload in a way which I think we can sympathise with. New technologies are spreading more information than any individual could compass, then there are difficulties in working out what to believe. And for Britain, new observations through the telescope expand the cosmos and the colonisation of the Americas expands the known world. So the sense that there is too much to know and how difficult it is to know um, characterizes this anxiety of variety that is typical of the anatomy. Burton complains uh, that he hears new news every day, and this is the long uh, quotation on the center of your um, screen at the moment, which I won't read from the beginning, um, but just to demonstrate the ways in which his prose is full of lists of overstimulating bombardments of information. These lists tend to end in etc, suggesting that they could go on forever. And the phrase etc or, or um, uh, and C um, appears well over a thousand times in the pages of the anatomy. And the reader's experience in the landscape of the anatomy can thus be one of bewilderment. But variety is not only a cause for anxiety in the anatomy, it's also one of the work's great pleasures, distracting and interesting the reader in endless anecdotes and digressions. And one of the places where I think you can see this most clearly is in the index um, to the book, which you have an excerpt from on the right hand side, which shows the ways that um, a kind of curious variousness can be a real charm. So here you have, um, alongside uh, medical contexts like fasting, a cause of melancholy, but a cure of love melancholy, or fear, a cause of melancholy, flaxen hair, a great motive of love, fiery devils, fish, what melancholy, fish good, fish is in love, fishing and fowling, how and when good exercise. So it gives a good impression of the miscellaneity and the scatty minded interest of the anatomy of melancholy. And really, I think of the anatomy as a grand mechanism which transforms or metabolizes the negative effects of melancholy into positive. Melancholy, Burton suggests repeatedly, is an ambivalent gift. The anatomy shifts us from the anxiety of variety to its pleasures, training the melancholic's distraction and rumination and obsessive and negative thought into enjoyably absorbed attention. Uh, Burton repeatedly reminds the reader to switch from solipsistic brooding into participation in the common predicament of being human, fallible, 
prone to grief and sorrow, and nonetheless both lovable and laughable. Cure in the early modern period doesn't mean escaping melancholy entirely, it doesn't mean um, becoming finally well, but it means being reconciled to the tolerability of, um, of how one is living. It means improvement. And Burton chose this pseudonym Democritus Jr. for the anatomy because the ancient philosopher Democritus was known as the laughing philosopher, as opposed to Heraclitus, who was the weeping philosopher. And the structure of the anatomy also enacts this transition from the tragedy to the comedy of melancholy. And the book's divided into three partitions. The first partition looks at the causes and symptoms of melancholy, uh, lamenting how universal it is, its incorrigible plurality, infinite variety, inevitability. But then the second turns to cure. And many of the things which are causes in the first partition become cures in the second. So the first partition has a long complaint on the misery of scholars who are overworked and surrounded by disdain for their true expertise and inadequately rewarded um, for their labours, um, a situation not entirely unrecognisable to many academics today. But in the second partition, the study is recast as the pleasurable absorption of attention in the subject and the prime consolation for melancholy. So one of the simplest urges that we had in curating the exhibition was the hope that visiting it would be like the anatomy itself, a pleasurable absorption of attention in various things. And like Burton, we tried in the structure of the exhibition to move from a concern with causes and symptoms into thinking about cure, and especially thinking about ways of putting agency into the hands of the sufferer. So Burton does talk about medical remedies and pills and potion, potions, um, some of them uh, for, to our mind, uh, rather bizarre, like, for example, anointing your fa face with hare's blood overnight, or ram's lungs applied hot to the forepart of the head, or making a ring out of an ass's right forefoot. Um, though he also recommends that you don't wear the skin of a sheep which has been worried by a wolf, um, because it will produce anxiety. But the bulk of his attention to cure is devoted to what are called technically the six non-naturals um, in a tradition which goes back to the ancient uh, writer and medicine Galen. These are six circumstantial influences which can increase and decrease the presence of the humours in the body and which could thus be adjusted either by the physician or by the sufferer themselves um, in order to, to improve their health. So the first five of these in various ways sound quite commonsensical to us. So they are diet, um, retention and evacuation, um, which is the expulsion or not of various uh, fluids from the body, air, exercise and sleep. Um, and we didn't, we decided not to include a case in the exhibition on retention and evacuation for what I hope are obvious reasons. But we did look in the, um, in the exhibition at Burton's attention to diet and air and exercise and sleep, and how that links with contemporary research in neuroscience and the ways in which changing what or how much one eats, spending time in green spaces, exercising the mind or body, regulating sleep affects one's mood. And that means that in lots of the cases in the exhibition, um, we've brought together material from Burton's time um, and um, more contemporary material to show continuities um, and changes in the way that people have treated these themes. So, for example, in the exercise section, um, you have on the one hand uh, items like on the right hand side of the screen at the moment uh, of the screen. Um, uh, the Art of Swimming, a book that attempts to teach you how to swim um, uh, through pictures and text. And you can see one of the um, extraordinary diagrams of how that's supposed to happen on the right hand side. Um, in the context of, uh, of curating the exhibition at a time when wild swimming was, was a topic that was, um, that was widely in the news in the early parts of the pandemic as something that people were, were doing. Or um, we bring Burton's digression of air, where he discusses the ways that air and environment and atmosphere can affect your health alongside um, 
uh, 20th century um, invitations to travel by train to Skegness and be braced by the sea air. Um, in the exercise section, the curator of that section, Professor John Geddes, who was at the time head of the Department of Psychiatry, um, exhibited a bicycle wheel which he had himself made over the course of the pandemic. Um, and the sleep section brings together Britain's prescriptions for sweet sleep, including poppy, violets, roses, lettuce, mandrake, henbane, nightshade, saffron, nutmeg and willow, alongside more contemporary poems which discuss insomnia and a kind of mini history of the ways in which people have tried to regulate sleep over the past 400 years. And the diet section looks at Britain's prescriptions for foods that are and aren't melancholy. Um, I can advise you against eating hair, for example, but um, uh, to be frank, Britain suggests that almost anything one could possibly eat is melancholic and that really only apples are universally agreed not to be. Um, and it brings that material alongside um, one of the curators who works on the microbiome and the way that the that gut bacteria have a relation to contemporary mental health, um, not just contemporary mental health, but to the ways that contemporary mental health research has, has shown experimentally that there are relationships between the health of the gut and the health of the mind. Um, that's the first of the first five of the six non-naturals, but the six uh, of the sixth is what Burton calls passions and perturbations of the mind, which in some ways is, I think, less immediately recognisable to us. Um, in the early modern period, passion was a typical word for what we now call emotion. And Burton says that it is the greatest of all the non-natural causes of melancholy, while in the other five, the body works on the mind, in the passions and perturbations, it is the mind that works on the body. And so tempering the passions and thus calming the tempestuous weather of the mind was one of the major ways of tempering melancholy in the period. And it takes up a greater proportion of the anatomy than the other non-naturals. And in the exhibition, we have three sections which examine three of these um, modes of tempering the tempest of the mind, faith on the one hand, um, religion, prayer, um, mirth, music and merry company, um, which is one of Britain's major prescriptions for mental well-being, and finally the therapeutic effects of reading and writing. And this is particularly important for the anatomy of melancholy, I think. Britain himself testifies to the ways in which writing the book was a kind of self-cure he was himself a melancholic. Um, you may remember, um, you may have seen in Christchurch uh, Cathedral, the Burton's Memorial, um, which is on the right-hand side of the screen, um, in which he is commemorated as Democritus Jr., as his pseudonym from the anatomy, and which bears a, um, a dedication which says, cui vitam dedit et mortam melancholia. Um, so Democritus Jr., to whom melancholy gave both life and death. He confesses various points in the anatomy that he was melancholic. He says, I write of melancholy by being busy to avoid melancholy, and says that he writes to ease his mind by writing. Um, and he also, despite his manifest bookishness, claims that while others who've written of melancholy um, get their knowledge by books, I mine by melancholizing. And Burton is the first person to use the word melancholize in this sense, you know, to be a way of life that is indulgent of melancholy. So there's a kind of self-cure and self-help for the writer in The Anatomy of Melancholy, but there is also a cure for the reader. Um, the performance, Bertonian performance of melancholy is an opportunity for the reader to encounter themselves. He says on only the second page of the book, thou thyself art the subject of my discourse. So you, reader, are who I am writing about. And it's the singular thou that he uses. You, individual reader, are the person to whom this is addressed. One of Burton's Christchurch contemporaries, um, a poet called Henry King, who would later become a bishop, and was also a friend of John Donne's. Um, he wrote a poem to a friend in which he recommended the anatomy, and this is on the right-hand side of your screen at the moment. Um, and it begins, 
if in this glass of humours you do find the passions or diseases of your mind, here without pain you safely may endure, though not to suffer, yet to read your cure. So what King says here is that reading the anatomy allows you to encounter your own melancholy and to pay attention to it without pain, and in so doing, to cure yourself by reading. Um, and one of my other ulterior motives in, um, uh, in curating the exhibition was to, uh, was to hope that more people would read The Anatomy of Melancholy. And there is, in fact, a wonderful new edition of The Anatomy of Melancholy um, edited by Angus Gowrand, which came out last year, again, in commemoration of the 400th anniversary. Um, so it is now easily, more easily accessible and easier to read than it has previously been. So just before I end, I wanted to give you a few um, uh, indications of what I feel I have learned through the process of curating this exhibition, um, which was something new for me, both the process of curating, um, which I hadn't done before, but also um, the working with um, colleagues in psychiatry and neuroscience. Um, I have often worked um, uh, in a way that previously that I called interdisciplinary, um, but which usually meant working with other people who work in the humanities. So collaborating with historians and people in modern languages and with people who work on um, the ancient world, for example. And this was my first experience of working um, uh, on a project with um, colleagues from the sciences and doing something genuinely between our disciplines. And this taught me various things, among them the fact that um, we are taught, humanists and scientists, to think very differently. Um, and we came to the material with a very different attitude. Um, it also, um, I was continually surprised during the process of the curation by the different ways in which um, they were surprised by things in the anatomy um, that I thought were, were straightforward and, and recognised things in the anatomy that, um, the, that I didn't. So they were all astonished by the ways in which they felt that this 400 year old book was anticipating um, things that are very timely now, like the microbiome, like thinking about green space um, and its relation to mental health, um, like um, thinking about exercise and the role of exercise in mental health and um, all the various things that we were looking at in the exhibition. And one of the things that taught me is that the disciplinary history of psychiatry and the way that we have tended to think about mental health um, has been changing in the last 20 years in ways that bring it paradoxically more in line with Burton than previously. So what I understand from my colleagues is that psychiatry was until relatively recently preoccupied by a model of mental illness um, where diagnosis, identification of specific um, ill health, and then the pharmaceutical treatment of it, so deciding on the appropriate prescription, um, was, was the major driver both of um, practical activity in uh, hospitals and also of research. And more recently, they have come to be working, at least the Oxford department, um, in a much more holistic way that thinks about the context of mental well-being in a whole life, that thinks about um, everybody as being on a spectrum of mental health rather than um, a division between the ill and the well, and that thinks about um, the ways in which uh, we can make ameliorative changes to lifestyle to make um, ourselves more well without an aim of um, total cure and um, the aims to make ourselves tolerable to ourselves and flourishing um, rather than thinking about the pharmaceutical ways that um, mental ill health can be eradicated. It also led me to think a lot about the ways that something like Burton's book, which in lots of ways rests on completely obsolete scientific bases. So Burton, uh, for Burton, astrology is extremely important as both a cause and a mode of curing um, melancholy. Um, the humoral theory itself, of course, is, is no longer um, is no longer taken 
um, seriously and um, lots of things that Britain thinks of as being causes of, men of mental ill health which um, range from um, you know spirits, um, uh, witches, uh, the, the effects of the, the fall, things that don't enter into our contemporary parlance. So this is a book which rests on all of these things um, but which nonetheless has quite a lot still to teach us. And this has made me reflect on the ways in which um, one of the things that a system or a book like The Anatomy of Melancholy can do is give you a vocabulary in which to explain your idiosyncrasy to yourself. Like other forms of, of self-description um, and large-scale systems like astrology or like um, psychoanalysis, for example, what the, the system gives you is a language in which to find your own idiosyncrasy, relate your particular circumstance to broader scale um, structures and ways of thinking about things um, in a way that helps make, um, make you both interested in your own idiosyncrasy and make it more tolerable, make your um, particularities more bearable. And one of the things that's been exciting about the exhibition was working with an artist called Hermit Gill on a project to do with the ways that astrology and other um, factors and contemporary models of um, the factors that affect birth and that determine one's propensity um, to mental well-being or ill health. Um, how, how these might be visually constructed, and she has a wonderful installation in the in the foyer to the Western Library, which if you can visit, um, if you happen to be close enough to Oxford, I really recommend. But the final thing which I'll say about what I learned from the process um, was to myself be a reader of the anatomy again. This was partly through the various events and public outreach events we've done in relation to the exhibition. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see a still from a production, a dramatic production of the anatomy of melancholy, which we brought to Oxford just this weekend um, and which was performed in the church where Burton was vicar um, down by the train station in Oxford um, on Saturday evening. And one of the things that um, talking to lots of people about the anatomy of melancholy, not in my usual academic context, but in the context of the exhibition and the public engagement and outreach events, has been to realise the ways in which Burton's address to the reader um, and address to the particular reader is addressed um, to everybody and also to me. I had got so used to reading the book as an academic that I had ceased to uh, recognize myself in it and has been really revivifying for me to be working on this. And finally, we worked on this all the way through the pandemic. Our first uh, curatorial meeting was in March, 2020. Um, and the um, opening of the exhibition was at the end of September, 2021. And every week in between, we met on screen to discuss this project. And the whole time we were extremely conscious of the ways in which um, the stuff that we were discussing to do with melancholy and cure through exercise and green space and um, good air and company was incredibly pertinent to the ways that people were suffering and the ways that people were trying to remedy their suffering during lockdowns and the pandemic. The last, almost the last words of the anatomy of melancholy um, are what Burton calls um, his, his final conclusion. Um, Give not way to solitariness and idleness, he says. Be not solitary, be not idle. This was incredibly difficult advice to take during the pandemic when lots of us had um, enforced solitariness and enforced idleness to contend with. But as a simple encapsulation of the ways in which The Anatomy of Melancholy is a book that keeps you company as you read, I think it's extraordinarily good advice. Thank you all for listening. Um, I'm now going to uh, open up to questions and I think turn over to Marco to, to chair the questions, is that right? Katie, thank you so much. That was so terrific. Um... It's one thing to go to the exhibition and see some of the exhibits in real life, which is, of course, exceptional. But to have a curator speak to us and talk us through is a real treat. Uh, so please do put your questions or comments um, into the chat box or use the raise hand function.
Um, but certainly, Katie, I wonder just some of the, the cures to mm -hmm. uh, melancholy, or we will probably talk about most of this as depression. It's, it's a very mm -hmm. negative mm -hmm. connotation. But um, the, the many things, exercise, reading, music, prayer mm -hmm. is talked about quite a lot, access mm -hmm. to nature, green spaces, water, and quality of sleep. What do you think? Is Oreo the perfect place on <laughs> earth? <laughs> well, um, one of the, uh, I mean, obviously, yes, next question. Um, but <laughs> one of the, um, one of the um, items we have in the exhibition is um, a, a set of engravings um, from the mid 17th century of Oxford colleges, um, which are showing uh, the setup of the colleges and one of the things so unfortunately alas it's not Oriole that we have that we have um, exhibited in the exhibition it's actually Merton but one of the things that the drawing brings out is that a college is a space which especially um, in in Oxford a space which allows for the 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 stimulation of the variety of the six non-naturals and lots of the things that Burton recommends as cure. So there are spaces for physical exercise. There is all Christchurch meadow before you um, uh, to take walks by the river, which is very soothing to melancholy, Burton tells us. Um, you live in a community which um, tends to your diet, even if Burton um, complains of Christchurch that they feed him too frequently, um, for the optimal digestion. So they feed him apparently every five hours, when in fact it should be every seven. But that that food is communal. You know, you have you have the pleasures of study, which he calls the sovereign remedy um, for melancholy, um, but you also have the stimulation of company. Um, and so for all of these reasons, uh, you know, a college is particularly well set up. Um, uh, as a as a space in which to to find remedies, but he's not at the same time blind to the ways in which colleges can also be colleges or academic contexts can also be um, very difficult. Um, study itself, uh, if you are not alternating alternating it with other things, is extremely desiccating. Um, he says so. You know, kind of endless uh, sitting with no exercise. Um, absorbed in, in your work is overstimulation on one axis of what a human life should be and um, requires alternation. So students are particularly prone to melancholy in the subsection Misery of Scholars, which is very long, um, addresses the specific ways in which students and scholars are, are particularly inclined to melancholy. And something which I hadn't realised before working on the exhibition, obviously um, in my work um, and in my in the context of the college today and the context of the whole university today, we're very concerned about student mental health. Um, and the psychiatrists were talking um, about um, epidemics of mental ill health among students, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. One of the things I hadn't realized was that early modern writers were also specifically concerned with the mental health of students. So there are quite a lot of medical manuals published in the early uh, in the in the late 16th early 17th century which are specifically designed um, to, to temper student ill health um, in this regard and what they recommend in all things is moderation this is always the the the, uh, the, the stipulation that they offer we have a few questions coming through paul dolan asks could you say something about the reception of the anatomy by the elite readers of the times not tranquil times politically or in terms of religion um, sure. So, uh, sorry, could you could you read the second half of that? So I, I got the elite re readers. Um, oh, they weren't certainly not tranquil times politically or in terms of religion. No, absolutely not. So, so one of the things, so first of all, it was immensely popular. So all of the editions sold out, but it was not a cheap book. So it's, so the first edition is a quarto, which is a kind of about this size. But then every edition after that is in the largest format available, a folio, very long book. By the end, it's 771 pages long. That's a lot of paper, expensive paper. So it's an expensive book. And so the people who would be buying it would be gentry, you know, people with some degree of wealth, scholars, Oxford colleges, Cambridge colleges, that kind of thing. Um, and we know 
from annotations, references, uh, and uh, general discussion that it's a very um, that, it's, that it's widely read. Um, you're absolutely right. The early 17th century is a very tempestuous time politically and uh, in the religious context. Um, and I was saying earlier that Burton likes to strike a, a middle path, recommends moderation. Um, and one of the sections of the book I didn't discuss is the final third partition, um, which is devoted to love melancholy. And the first half is a very kind of cheerful uh, and comic uh, romp through um, the symptoms of love melancholy supported by plays and poetry. But the second half is devoted to religious melancholy. And there, sorry, there he tries to um, mediate between, on the one hand, the dangers of excess superstition, which he associates with Catholicism, and on the other hand, with a dangerous enthusiasm and belief in one's own inspiration, which he associates with kind of radical Protestantism and, um, and the opposite extreme of religion in England in the time. So there, as elsewhere, Burton's emphasis is on a kind of middle um, way, in a way which later would be recognised as very typical of the English church um, and, and a kind of developing Anglicanism. Thank you for that question. We have a couple of related questions. Stefan Stern asks, did Burton read Rabelais and Montaigne? And John Chetto asks, did Burton read Montaigne? And if so, what influence did he have on Burton? Um, well, it's fantastic that you asked this because I have in fact written an entire article about <laughs> the influence of Montaigne on Robert Burton. Um, yes, is the short answer. He did read both Rabelais and Montaigne. He knows Montaigne much better than uh, Rabelais, partly because there's an English translation of Montaigne published in 1603 by Florio, John Florio, who was one of Burton's friends um, and acquaintances in Oxford um, in the earlier part of the 17th century. And I think one of the things about how Burton reads Montaigne, on the one hand, he really takes on um, Montaigne's kind of interest in the self, um, he takes on that kind of wavering, um, distractible style that moves from topic to topic um, and also kind of incorporates sources and poetic sources within his own prose. Um, and that concentration on the self and the contemplative thinking self. So Burton's style, you can really see the mind in the act of thinking, which is something that he's partly getting from Montaigne. But what he doesn't take from Montaigne or what he changes about Montaigne is that rather than a self-exposure um, and a performance of the self, um, is that he refocuses all of that on the reader's discovery of themselves in the anatomy. So at the end of, of Montaigne's um, preface to the reader um, in his essays, he says, I myself am the matter of my book. Um, but Burton, as I uh, quoted, uh, in the in, when I was talking earlier, transforms that into thou thyself art the subject of this discourse. So he picks up the Montaignean interest in idiosyncrasy and the irreducible particularity of the individual self. But rather than talking extensively about himself, he talks extensively about um, about the reader, or he invites the reader to find themselves in the book. Um, so yes, he's very Montaignean. Uh, Kate Whittington has a question. Would you like to unmute Kate and ask in person? Well, sure. Um, hi, thank you, Katie. That was so interesting. Um, I was really interested in the way you talked about how like, the experience was like a revitalizing experience for understanding the text itself. And I was wondering whether, I've never obviously created an exhibition, but whether like the physical arrangement that that involves felt like a process of like re-anatomizing which is also mm. part of why you felt differently about it alongside the like interdisciplinary approach and whether mm. like being able to, oh, firstly, like how personal the arrangement of the exhibition was and whether that was like analogous to the process of making your own like, uh, like kind of directory of like melancholy um, mm. and whether there was something like physical about it that added something to the dimension of just like the pure study with the book, which was new, mm. I guess, alongside like the outreach and the theatre and all those kind of things. Yeah, no, great question. Um, 
and also hello, it's lovely to see you. Um, the, um, yeah, so, I mean, one thing that, that sprang to mind immediately as you were talking was that, you know, as, um, as someone who's been reading and working on and writing about the anatomy for 20 years since I was myself an undergraduate, I'm kind of accidentally pre-persuaded. You know, I don't know, <laughs> my, my, my days of, of the initial kind of moment of excitement about what is it that's actually really excited about the anatomy um, are quite a long time ago now. And my students are a kind of captive audience and other academics are a captive audience when I talk to them at conferences. But part of the process of putting together the exhibition was thinking, you know, what is interesting about this? You know, what are people going to find exciting? And also the, you know, my encounter with, with people from other disciplines, um, from, from neuroscience and psychiatry meant that, that I was, I was paying attention to what they are enthusiastic about you know what they found surprising or interesting and that alienated the book from me something that has become very familiar over um, long years of working on it in a way that was really revitalizing but another thing is that you were talking about the kind of physical process of working with the books because burton donated over 800 books to the bodleian um lots of the books that we were working with were his books. Um, so there was a kind of sense of continuity in um, taking, so the, the image that I showed you of um, the melancholy night, for example, we have that in the exhibition and it's Burton's copy of that book that we have in the exhibition. Um, so there was a sense of kind of, um, you know, physically moving <laughs> with, his, with his books in, uh, and, and, you know, touching the objects. Another thing, a wonderful thing, which um, uh, which is in the first case, um, is, is Burton's own astrological notebook. So this is a little notebook that he kept with all of his own notes on astrology and on all of his reading in astrology, and lots of horoscopes that he cast himself, including his own birth horoscope. And that horoscope tells him that he was born under the sign of Saturn, which is the patron of melancholy, that Saturn is the strongest um, uh, star in his chart, um, which means that he is the kind of dominant influence on his life. It told him also, ironically, that Mercury is the weakest star in his chart and Mercury is the patron of, of writing. Um, so, you know, he kind of bucked the, uh, the, the um, diagnostic trend of his horoscope by, by copiously um, uh, writing, although there would be a way of thinking that it's the, the impossibility of ever ceasing to write that might be his disorder that relates to, to mercurial writing. But that, you know, is an incredibly personal document, really related to his own sense of himself and his sense of orientation in the world and so so that kind of contact with with his actual books was really important um, in the process of, of um, curating thanks Kate it's a lovely question we have one last question if we may the hour is starting to draw to a close but uh, Pippa McGowan asks did Burton differentiate between anxiety and depression or is that a more modern approach so on the one hand, yes, that is a more modern approach, you know, that's our vocabulary for, for how we talk about it. But I was struck very much by you know, the, the definition that he offers um, in the anatomy, and which is a standard definition, you know, he hasn't um, made it up, talks about fear and sorrow without cause. And if you think about fear as mapping roughly onto anxiety, um, you know, fear without cause is really what anxiety um, is, and sorrow as mapping onto um, depression, then in a sense he's seeing the same phenomena um, of, of um, disorder and mental ill health that we still encounter in ourselves and in others today, but has a different vocabulary and a different mode of articulation to think about them. Um, but that kind of dyad that recognizes that there's something different about a state of kind of fear or anxiety and a state of sorrow, but that they are intimately linked is something that he also understands or that the medicine of his time understands. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, Well, thank you again, Katie, for an absolutely fantastic talk.
Um, I'm really pleased that everyone could join us and I hope you'll come back to Oriel soon. As I said, we're open for events again. Everything is back to as much normal as we can possibly imagine uh, at the moment. And I hope to see you at the garden party, if not sooner. For those of you who are traveling further, please do join, uh, or for everybody, please do join our series of online events. These are terrific discussions and it's lovely to see so many people. Thank you for coming. Good night. Thank you very much.